What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. Welcome, bike, for another week of draft prep with Nicholas. This is Big Dogs Gotta Eat BDGE Fantasy Football. It is probably the last Monday that you will be watching me to help prepare for your drafts. Most people already drafted are drafting this week or are going to be drafting over the following weekend. A lot of you guys ask, when is our E-Town Get Down League, the league with myself, Snacks and Animal, and our friends from high school? We draft every single year on Labor Day Monday. Don't you ask me again. Same day every year, Labor Day Monday, vlog up later that week. But I said, listen, hold up. What's the best way that we could possibly help these people prepare in their final weeks, the final supper, the final film? What's more simple than some rankings, some top 50 overall rankings, the first four rounds of your draft? The majority of production in your fantasy lineup is going to come from your first four picks, okay? Very, very important that you get these right. Sure, it's fantastic when you hit on a 7th, a 10th, a 12th rounder, but that's no guarantee. That's few and far between. That's biannually. Every year, you better be hitting on your first four picks, all right? So we're looking at the top 50 players. I'll try to run through them semi quickly we'll take a look at the good the bad the fugly and i hope you all enjoy i just want to say uh thank you guys thank everybody out there for the support that we got this summer i know there was a little bit of a dip in terms of just overall growth and engagement and all that kind of stuff due to covid there's a lot of people that are not doing fantasy leagues waited till the last minute to prepare because they didn't think football was going to happen but it is here we are so bike and i'm ready to hit you today with with everything i've learned over the last six months so without further ado let's tuck our shirts in Let's stop yelling. Let's eat. All right, we bike. If at any point you don't even want to watch this video and you just want my full rankings, they are live. They are available in the Big Dogs draft guide. You have PPR, you have standard, you have half PPR, you have super flex, all available, thankfully, to Monkey Knife Fight, who is sponsoring the draft guide this year. You can get everything in the draft guide for literally $10, plus that $10 to play with on Monkey Knife Fight. It has the rankings. It's got my must draft players. It's got my must avoid players. The official do not draft list. The sleepers, the undervalued, the overvalued, tons of exclusive content. The Big Dogs Bible, which is like 10,000 verses on exactly how to attack your fantasy football draft this year. MonkeyKnifeFight.com. Go to their website. When you deposit $10, use the promo code BD. G E play a game of $2 on their website. And I will email you access to the draft guide. It's got everything you need for your 2020 fantasy football draft. If you don't want to watch the rest of my rankings or you want the rankings right now, which I'm going to throw up on the screen. So one through 25, then we'll run through 26 through 50 afterwards, compare them, dice them up, throw them in a cocktail and drink them down. ECR versus ADP. So you see ECR on the left side of the last two columns. ECR is expert consensus rankings. Okay. So those dudes that submit their rankings through Yahoo or ESPN, the fantasy football is all the guys that you all know and love and sometimes hate, whatever. They submit through fantasy pros. So it throws us all into these fantasy pros rankings together and then it compares where we have our guys ranked, right? And it gives us a minus, a plus, whatever. ADP is pulled from fantasy football calculator, which is absolute trash because we have so many other good ADPs right now in the industry, FFPC, underdog, best ball drafts. So take the ADP with a McDonald's size grain of salt from fantasy football calculator. As you can see in the green, what you'll see is my guys that I'm higher on than ECR as well as ADP, the guys that are more highlighted in red, me low we're on than ECR and ADP. The first five or six guys, we are absolutely in sync. C-Max, Saquon, Zeke, Kamara, and you could probably make the case, Kamara, Henry, whatever you want to do. Then you start seeing the Clydes, the Sanders, and the Jacobs. I'm a little bit higher on them than consensus because I've been hammering this with a nail into your brain holes that we want running backs. We want running backs early. We want running backs often. We want our workhorses cemented into that lineup because they are hard to get after round two, after round three. Those are the bust rate. The dead zone for running backs exists in those middle rounds, whereas the wide receivers there are juicy, they're beautiful, and the positional fantasy points per game drop-off to those mid-round wide receivers is not massive like it is with the running backs. So we want running backs early and often, right? In a raw vacuum, maybe one of these guys doesn't perform as well as the wide receivers available there, but running backs win leagues, and running backs are much harder to replace. Wins over replacement are what you're looking for when you're talking about fantasy football analysis, and running backs move the needle in that sense. So we have Clyde above Miles. I get this question all the time. 
Clyde or Miles? Clyde or Miles? Half PPR, full PPR, standard. Well, if you want all of them, obviously you have to go to the draft guide to see if it differs in different scoring formats. But we have Clyde above Miles because of the Miles injury that we still don't know much about. The whole injury to Miles, right? I made the video and I want to talk about the injury optimism a little bit. If you're new to the channel, one of the things I say is one of the biggest mistakes most fantasy players make is injury optimism, having too much injury optimism, believing beat reporters that come out and say, oh, this guy looks good. He's back to 100%. He's fully healthy. He looks faster than he ever did before. Nine times out of 10, if a guy goes into the year injured, he's going to re-injure himself. It's just, it's just science. We have scientific timetables. The likelihood of you getting re-injured is exponentially higher. We don't say guys are injury prone, but if they go into the year with an injury, if they're less than 100%, the chances of them either re-injuring that body part or having a compensation injury because that other muscle needs to adapt to the fact that the thing they hurt is not at 100%. It just exponentially raises their injury rate, okay? We see it year in, we see it year out, and it is a very high hit rate. Doesn't happen all the time. But with Miles Sanders, I think it's important not to just go by like beat reports, but when you hear players, when you hear himself, when you hear coaches all talking about how they're not worried about it, it gives you a little bit more of a sense of ease. And the fact that the NFL season is kicking off a week later than it typically does makes me feel better about a guy like Miles Sanders, okay? Because he's had now, he's going to have three weeks or so to prepare. We have two full weeks until the NFL season actually kicks off. That's Sunday, all right? I can't believe we're here. I can't believe we fucking made it to the NFL season. It's happening. We had football on last night. Austin P. I don't even know how. To, what kind of name is that? Austin P-E-A-Y. Someone give me an origin comment on that, please. But right now, Miles Sanders is a guy that I'm actually not too worried about injury-wise because we they didn't sign a veteran. They didn't go out. If they were really concerned about him missing week one, I think they would have gone out and looked at a guy like Devonta Freeman or looked at a guy like, I don't know, fucking J.H.I. because he's already been in the system. He knows it. Or looked at a guy like Blau Powell. I'm just naming shit off the top of my head. But y'all get the point. From everything we've seen and heard, it's not a serious injury. So Miles Sanders continues to stay up there. And you have Josh Jacobs right behind him at eight. I think people are looking too hard at the Jacobs thing. Listen, they came out and they were like the next phase of Josh Jacobs is going to be getting him more involved in the passing game, getting him more involved in the receiving game. It is hard for a rookie to come out and learn the blocking schemes and learn the pass routes. So yes, they signed Jalen Richard because who loves veterans more than John Gruden does? I'll answer that for you. Nobody. There's a reason he brings in Jason Witten. They want veteran presence. They want locker room presence. They want these guys who know the league, especially in a summer like we have right now. Why get rid of Jalen Richard to sign a new guy to take his role when they don't know the system, when they're not going to have a lot of practice time together? Sign Jalen Richard because there's literally no other running backs on that depth chart. Like who else do they have on that depth chart besides Josh Jacobs, Jalen Richard? They signed Theo Riddick and everybody's making a whole fucking fuss about Theo Riddick. Guys, they waived some other no-name running back. Like, I think they just looked at it and said, would we rather have this undrafted free agent who's not performing well at training camp or a veteran in Theo Riddick? You guys want to talk about Devontae Booker? Devontae Booker's literally never been good. He, like, got forced passes in Denver, and he he's just a, not a good running back. So he's not getting on the field either. I objectively see that they can continue to add these types of running backs. But the thing with Josh Jacobs is, when you look at him from a running back standpoint, right, he's probably borderline top five in terms of just a pure runner at this point. I think there's, like, Derrick Henry... Ezekiel Elliott, Nick Chubb in no particular order. You guys know I don't feel like arguing with you right now. But like those guys, maybe Saquon and then Josh Jacobs is right there in that borderline role. Yes, he didn't catch a lot of balls last year. But if they get him just a little bit more involved in the receiving game, right? He sees three targets. You know what three targets a game is? One, it's not much. Two, it equates to almost 50 targets on the year. If we're getting Josh Jacobs seeing 18 to 22 carries a game with his efficiency, with this offensive line. Again, I like Derek Carr because he's a sum of his parts quarterback. Jacobs is almost the same thing, except he's actually good at his position. Anytime a running back relies heavily on the ground game for fantasy production, a lot of it's going to lie in the offensive line. And the Raiders have a very good offensive line. Derrick Henry last year running behind the Titans had a very good offensive line. Ezekiel Elliott, not very good in the passing game for fantasy. For the most part, he relies on his offensive line to open up holes, to open up the touchdown lanes, right? This is what happens. And Oakland has a good offensive line. So I don't want to look too much past that. Like, yes, okay, he's not going to catch 50 passes this year, but he could still run for 1,400, 1,500 yards. And in that case, all he needs to do is put up 150, 200 receiving yards. And you're still looking at a monster year out of this guy who I think has a lot more touchdown upside than people are giving him credit for. So I still like Josh Jacobs a lot in the first round, despite all of these signings that people are going nuts about. Then we have Dalvin Cook at nine. Dalvin Cook is interesting, of course, because we have the contract negotiations. I have no idea what his status is. I have no idea if he's going to play this season, but he's too talented to drop him out of that like tier of running back. So he's the last guy in the tier of those top running backs. What I will say with Dalvin Cook, I hope not to have to draft him in the first round with my first pick. If I do, I am making damn sure that I'm getting Alexander Madison a round or two before his ADP is. I'm making sure he is on my team because that is way too risky to draft Alvin Cook without getting Madison. Between the injury concerns, 
the contract concerns. There are a lot of red flags there. You have to draft Madison if you're drafting Cook, which is kind of another reason why you don't want to draft Cook in the first place, because you have to pair him with like an eighth round Madison, which takes away a pick that might be like a Julian Edelman or a Tyler Boyd, one of those types of guys that you would rather have on your roster than just a handcuff. So all in all, Dalvin Cook, too talented to drop him out of the first round, but he's not a guy that I'm necessarily targeting. And then, you know, I think you just got to throw some respect on Michael Thomas's name. So we're going to throw him there at 10, even though I probably will not be taking wide receiver in the first round. Joe Mixon. I don't know what the fuck's going on with Joe Mixon. He's got the migraines. He's got the contract. He's coming out on Twitter, sending suggestive tweets at somebody. I don't know who is it targeted at. I don't know what the fuck is going on, but he was always a guy that I was a little bit weary of because I don't know what the passing game work is going to be. However, 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 I do want to read a little passage from the Football Outsiders Almanac. Y'all have heard me talk about offensive lines. Y'all have heard me talk about DVOA and things like that. They're one of the really premier efficiency metrics, pace of play. And you're looking at offensive line rankings. Like they have a lot of really good free stuff on their website at footballoutsiders.com. They sent me over their almanac. And I'll be honest, I was a little intimidated. I don't, I don't read good. I don't read well, as some of you scholars would say. But this thing is awesome. It's broken down into like billion different sections that are extremely useful and extremely practical when you're preparing for fantasy. Or if you're just a big NFL fan, this is a really, really good reading. And I want to read an excerpt from Joe Mixon. And this is available for purchase on their website. They have it both digital and physical copy. And a lot of you old school people like to read stuff like snacks over there. I got I, there's literally a news there's a newspaper on the table because snacks actually physically reads newspaper. So I know a lot of you guys like physical copies of things. So this is available physically. So Mixon is sort of like Cooper Cup where it's like, what player are we getting going into 2020? You have the first half of the season that was terrible with Cooper Cup. It was great. Then you have the second half of the season where it was a big downturn, but for Mixon, it was great. I want to read this from the Almanac. In the first eight weeks of the year, Mixon had a negative 58 DYAR. DYAR, you know, I talked about value above replacement. That's why we like running backs. DYAR for football outsiders means defense adjusted yards above replacement. So like if other running backs were in his situation during these plays or whatever, how well did he perform? And in the first half of the year, again, it was negative. DVOA is the same thing with a little tweak in it. That was negative. And then it went completely positive over the second half of the year. After the Bengals is week nine by, he had a 147 DYAR and an 11.2% DVOA. He was dominant. And they said he's a strong receiver as well. One of just five running backs to post a double digit yak in his catches out of the backfield. 10.2. That's ridiculous. 10.2 yards after the catch per reception. And it seems incumbent upon Zach Taylor and his staff to utilize mixing more in the passing game. See, that is that is my my not issue, but that is my question mark here. Okay. We all have seen these players and we want them to get more involved in the passing situation. Right. And you could say the same thing for you're like, Oh, you're making the argument against Joe Mixon when you just made the argument for Josh Jacobs. However, we have a much bigger sample size with Joe Mixon, right? He came into this rookie year and we're like, Oh, he's so good in the receiving game. There's no way they don't use him in a three down role. Okay. You know, it was his rookie season. Let's give him a break. Comes into the second year, gets pretty involved in the receiving game, not to the level that would equate to his talent in my opinion. Opinion, but we're like, okay, he's going in the right direction a little bit. And then last year, Zach Taylor comes in and his receiving game numbers dip. Despite playing in two more games, he saw 10 fewer targets. So like, this is going to be the fourth year going that we're making excuses as to why he didn't get more involved in the receiving game. And we keep saying he's so talented in that direction, in that section of the game, they have to give him more involved. And I'm like, this is three years going on the sample size now. When for Josh Jacobs, we have one valid excuse that it was his rookie season and we don't have the sample size of whether or not they're going to give it to him. So I project, I'm probably being a little bit more optimistic than pessimistic here when it comes to Jacobs. But for Mixon, like Gio Bernard is still very much there. And Gio Bernard was very involved in the passing game last year. So it's not just that Gio is there, but it's the fact that we've continue to say Mixon is so talented and he's going to get involved in the passing game and then he's continued to disappoint year over year over year so why you know why are you throwing a dart on year four just expecting it to happen so that is my position on Joe Mixon and uh, this almanac is filled with like a bunch of nuggets a bunch of amazing stats that I'll probably continue to plug throughout this video what I would suggest is go to footballoutsiders.com, browse the website because they did just come out with this Football Outsiders Plus subscription. You can either do it in a yearly fashion or month by month thing. And in the Football Outsiders Plus subscription package, it comes with the Almanac, which again, you can get digitally or physically, plus like a million other little statistics and nuggets. It has weekly fantasy projections throughout the year. They even have like adjustments in their fantasy projections based on venue and weather and opponents' defensive tendencies, like stuff that you're really not about to get anywhere else. They've got the whole DVOA database. So if you want real efficiency metrics, like broken down by for real, like pace, 
time of play, time of possession. Five yards on third and four are worth more than five yards on first. Like some some crazy, crazy stuff that if you're a wild football fan, this is literally perfect for you. So I'm going to link that down in the description for you guys. Go check it out. Very much worth the price for the Football Outsiders Plus package. So we have Mixon at 11. Here is my other problem with Fantasy Pros is that I update my rankings and sometimes they do not save. As of right now, Austin Eckler is above Joe Mixon, okay? I would take Austin Eckler above Joe Mixon. I would also take Nick Chubb, Nick Chubb above Joe Mixon. Offensive lines tend to improve in very slow increments unless they add big weapons to the offensive line and take this massive improvement overnight. And that's what we might be seeing in Cleveland because they added two left tackles, one to play left tackle, one to play right tackle, right? Their first round pick as well as Jack Conklin. Like this is going to be a very formidable offensive line. We're going to see a big improvement in the run game, especially with Stefanski coming over. So Nick Chubb, just like the argument I made for Josh Jacobs, doesn't need to catch 50 passes because he could very well put 1500 yards up on the ground. However, the reason I have Chubb all the way down here is because, I mean, he is competing with Kareem Hunt. That is an objective red flag there. We don't know. Maybe Kareem Hunt's involvement gets a boost from last year. We saw the numbers dip down for Nick Chubb over the second half of the year, but with Kareem Hunt there, are they even more comfortable getting him the ball with a higher volume touch count? So the red flags are certainly there for Nick Chubb, but the upside, I think, is still getting taken away from him a little bit. You see 12 of the first 13 picks are running backs. Then we start getting to some of the wide receivers. I have Devontae Adams lower. I have Tariq Kill lower. I have Julio Jones lower. And again, and that's just a product of me wanting running backs. This is more of like a game theory strategy type thing. Again, like if I had to put money on whether or not Adams, Tyree Kill, and Julio Jones had more fantasy points than Joe Mixon or Austin Eckler, I would probably bet the former. But in the range of outcomes for the ceiling for those guys is legit league winning guys. And, and like wide receiver twos through fives very, very rarely push the needle when it comes to fantasy championships. So we make our way down the list. And you see a couple more green highlights. We have Lamar Jackson. I'm starting. I've said this before. If you're in that like one, two, three hole, it gets a little bit tricky depending on what you want to do in the second half of the round. I'm just like, you know what? There are a lot of question marks at wide receiver. There are some question marks, at, especially at running back. So like if you want to just take that Lamar Jackson, set it and forget it and let you put up 25 points a game in your quarterback role with some upside games of 40 points, I don't think you will regret the pick. So Lamar Jackson all the way up there at 20 for me. And then Adam Thielen at 22. Again, dude, I, I just don't understand how people are not hiring Adam Thielen. Like he is the only real threat to get targets in that offense. And Kirk Cousins has been wildly accurate. We've already seen them have legit NFL chemistry. We've seen Adam Thielen have legit wide receiver one upside. So I'm not even looking at Thielen as a floor play. Like if he finishes a top five fantasy wide receiver this year, would anybody be surprised? Stefan Diggs is in Buffalo now. Stefan Diggs not only saw 90 to 100 targets a year, but a lot of those are super valuable targets downfield. If he starts to get 25 to 30 percent of the deep targets that Stefan Diggs got, I mean, like like Little Wayne said, no ceilings, motherfucker, the sky's showing. Shout out to Spotify for putting Little Wayne's no ceilings mixtape on there, even though they are missing like six or seven songs. Long overdue. All right, so those are one through 25. Let's throw up 26 through 50. Nothing too crazy until we get a little bit lower down the list. Aaron Jones, y'all know I'm much lower on than consensus. I have him as a third. He's basically the only like real third round running back I want to own. His efficiency has been insane. And I will continue to read the verses from this beautiful, beautiful book. Jones had a 49.5% rushing DVOA in the red zone. Best among all players with at least 25 carries. Everyone's talking about how his rushing touchdowns are going to regress. Yeah, obviously. But as long as he gets some sort of volume down there, he's going to be really, 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 really good with it. That is not in the almanac. I've made that part up. The fact that his success rate actually improved after being given a bigger workload in 2019 bodes very well for his continued success, even if the Packers have yet to treat him like a true bell cow bike. It's also noticeable that Jones is having great success despite something of a square peg in a round hole in Matt LaFleur's system. Jones's 51.5% rushing DVOA out of shotgun was best in the league, even though they operated more under center, under LaFleur's leadership. So a lot of moving parts there. My thing is this, like Jones played on 60% of the snaps last year and they bring in A.J. Dillon. Now I have heard rumors that Jamal Williams is a possible trade candidate. If that happens, we're going to feel a little bit more comfortable at, about Aaron Jones. My problem is this, like I think we can all comfortably say that Aaron Jones will be in a committee no matter what, right? But it still might be a valuable committee. My problem is this, like the very, very large majority of his receiving work came in the games that Devonta Adams was gone. Adams missed four games. Aaron Jones' receiving numbers spiked. All three of his receiving touchdowns came in those three games. He became the primary target from Aaron Rodgers. I'm not expecting that to happen this year. If those four games were out of the picture or if you put him at his normal pace of receiving work, 
with Devontae Adams on the field, his numbers are looking a lot more shoddy here. And with AJ Dillon there, like even if Dillon's not really that involved, throwing a third running back into the mix is going to pull Aaron Jones's snap counts back from 60% to 53%. Maybe he doesn't take 85% of the goal line carries. Maybe he takes 55% of them now. And that's where it starts to become an issue because the inconsistency that we saw last year at least came with like ridiculously high boom rates. And I don't know if we're going to see that with Aaron Jones. It's just the small downtick in snaps, in routes, and all of this stuff just seems like we hit the perfect storm at Aaron Jones last year. I'm not really trying to double down on the double zero roulette wheel, if you get what I'm saying there. So I'm lower on Aaron Jones than consensus. You'll see I have Robert Woods much higher than ADP, but around the same spot as where ECR has him. So I'm kind of there with the uh, experts. I don't know why the ADP hasn't caught up for Robert Woods. People still look at him as like a boring floor play. But again, I've said this, like he had nearly 1300 yards in back-to-back seasons. There are a lot of players who have not got that. So I did my first redraft league last night. I realized that the E-Town get down was the only redraft league I'm in this year because I'm in like four or five dynasty leagues. So I was like, I need to, I need to get in some redraft league. And I joined uh, on Yahoo. They have Yahoo pro leagues. So you could actually join paid leagues with like random people all over the interwebs. And I like doing that. No offense. I like doing that more than doing them with you guys because I get to get my guys a little bit more, right? Like you guys are not always sniping me and trying to take my guys three rounds earlier. So I was able to start off. I, I had the one-on-one unfortunately, but I was able to have Christian McCaffrey at the one-on-one Eckler fell to me at the end of the second, and then Travis Kelsey. So I was able to start with those three. McCaffrey, Eckler, Kelsey. And I love that start. But obviously, I'm looking a little light at wide receiver. Woods was my wide receiver one, and I followed it back up with Terry. With Woods dropping, continuing to drop to the end of the fourth round, fifth round, like, I think he's one of the best, still one of the, like, we've been talking about him being the best value since April. And he continues to be a really good value in drafts. In the fourth round, you smash Robert Woods. And one of the things, like I get a lot of questions on my rankings in the draft guide on bigdogsdraftguide.com. If you're not eligible for the monkey knife fight promo, you could still purchase it through bigdogsdraftguide.com. One of the questions are like, do I just draft straight up based off your rankings? And I would say no. I would say it's important to take a mix of where I have them ranked, but also th- this is where the ADP kind of comes into play here. You could see where these players are being picked so that you don't have to reach, right? If I have a guy ranked like, like I have Robert Woods at 32, but his ADP is 26 spots further back, that means you don't have to draft him at 32. That means you could probably settle somewhere in the middle. So maybe wait the 13 picks, maybe chop it in half, wait an extra round, then get Robert Woods, knowing that you got a guy ranked 10 or 12 spots higher, but you didn't have to do it for another round or two because the ADP is 26 spots lower. That's the way I would start looking at it, right? ADP just tells you, where he's probably going to go in your draft. The rankings tell you where his value actually lies. So squeeze some value out of that by taking him a little bit later than the ranking. I hope that makes sense. A couple other guys that really stick out here, as you'll see, are Ronald Jones. This is one of those things where I think it's just not creeping up quick enough. And I know uh, they said he had some minor foot injury, but good news, he is back at practice as of Sunday. And we'll read another little tidbit out of the Football Outsiders Almanac. Again, get this at footballoutsiders.com. Sign up for their FO Plus subscription package. Ronald Jones essentially had a re- redshirt rookie season, but last year at midseason, he emerged as the Buccaneers' primary ball carrier and went on to become the team's first running back to gain 1,000 yards in scrimmage since Doug Martin bike in 2015. Again, they do not have the word bike in there. He flashed some explosiveness too. In 2018, he didn't have a single run of at least 10 yards. In 2019, he had 20, 20, 11.6% of his carries, Okay. That, that is what gets me excited. Like Ronald Jones has turned himself into an explosive guy. He's turned himself into someone who is probably the leading candidate to get a lot of third down work and get a lot of the goal line work. Like people are still really sleeping on Ronald Jones. And I love him here. If you miss running backs early, he's someone, again, you could see that ECR and ADP are way behind on Ronald Jones. So you don't actually have to take him at pick 43. You can get him in the fifth round. You can get him in the sixth round of some draft. And I think that is the sweet spot. In that draft, I was just talking about the Yahoo Pro League. Uh, he was my RB3. I got him in the sixth or seventh round. McCaffrey. Eckler, Kelsey, Woods, Terry, and I want to say I went Tyler Lockett and Ronald Jones bike to bike. So my 41-43, I was able to get in the, I think the five, I can't do the math right now off the top of my head, maybe six, seven turn. So that's the way you got to look at this again. Then we got Odell and Juju, man. A lot of guy, a lot of people are really, really into some kind of bounce back for these two. I'm having a lot of trouble getting on board. All the reports out of camp on Juju are really not good. Someone from The Athletic wrote an article saying that he's kind of disappeared at camp. And I'm trying to figure out why. I'm trying to figure out like, what is what is it that we miss with Juju? Because he was so good the second half of his rookie year, so good his sophomore year. Last year, everything, of course, can 
can be accounted for with the bad quarterback play and the injuries that he dealt with. But I'm nervous that like without an Antonio Brown there now, and I've changed my tune on this. This was not the case last year. I thought Juju would be able to succeed. But now, even if he is moved back into the slot, he's still going to be the primary concern for defenses in the passing game. And I think maybe by halfway through the year, they're going to be a little bit more concerned with Deontay Johnson. So I'm going to be a lot less lower on Juju Smith-Schuster because when we're looking at training camp reports in the offseason, you very rarely hear bad reports. So when you do, I think you really need to take a look at those. Like when you hear a guy is not performing well, when you hear a guy is out of shape, when you hear a guy is disappearing off the field, that is something to be concerned about, right? Because everything is a hype piece. Every, everybody looks so good. Everybody's in the best shape of their life. So that if you have 99% of your team in the best shape of their life and there's a guy who is standing out for looking bad, there's probably something to it. And I haven't really heard anything good about Juju. I'm not sold on this Pittsburgh offense being anywhere near what it was a couple of years ago. I think the offensive line is deteriorating a little bit. They don't have as many weapons out there. They're kind of just like throwing pieces against the wall and seeing what sticks at this point. So Juju has been pulled back pretty far in my rankings. Odell as well. I just, we haven't seen it in a while. He hasn't been able to stay healthy on the field for a full 16 games. And now we have this Stefanski offense, which I think is going to run through the offensive line, but run through the run game. Okay. So I think the running backs are going to be heavily involved. I like Baker Mayfield might throw the ball 450 times. I just don't think there's another. People are like, oh, it wasn't last year Odell's floor. It's like, again, when you look at floor and ceiling, the important question is not whether or not that's a player's floor or ceiling, but you have to follow it up with something like, okay, that's his floor. And how likely is that to repeat itself? And for me, like the 135 targets last year for Odell, I don't see it going that much higher. I, if anything, I see it dipping back a little bit, bringing in Austin Hooper, having Kareem Hunt for a full 16 games, being just way more run heavy. I'm, I'm nervous to grab Odell Beckham in the third round or even the early fourth round when you have these other young studs that are coming up and you want to get on that wave before the wave crashes, right? You don't want to wait and be like, eh, I don't know if DJ Chark or Terry McLaurin's really proven yet. We'll get him next year because guess what? Like this is the breakout year. So next year, you're going to have to draft him in the second. You know what I mean? So these are guys that are, that are just a little bit too questionable for me to invest in early round pick in them. That's why they're so far down my rankings. Now you have Cam Akers, who I'm much higher on than ECR and ADP because Darrell Henderson's hamstring injury. I have no idea if he's going to be ready for week one, but I feel like Cam Akers probably takes over the RB1 role because of this. And once he gets it, he is not going to lose it to Darrell Henderson. So Cam Akers is a really good fourth or fifth round pick right now, given the fact that he's still behind in ADP because it hasn't caught up yet. DeAndre Swift dealing with the leg injury. Like I said yesterday, I am concerned. I am concerned about DeAndre Swift. So you're gonna be like, how is he still ranked 49 for you? Well, guess what? I moved him down from like 36 down to 49 and it's probably still not even too low. I, I don't think I'll be taking him in the end of the fourth round, early fifth round. I, I think I said this yesterday in the video that along with me being concerned, let him drop to like the sixth or seventh round, snag him at value and he still will be the guy by week five or six in that Detroit bike field. He just won't really put up production early on in the year, which is how you have to value that as a discount in your fantasy lineups. So let me throw up the entirety of them bike to bike to bike to bike together. And there you have it. Those are my top 50 rankings for 2020 fantasy football as of August 30th. Oh, we're almost in September. Damn, where did summer go? Where did 2020 go? We still got a third left of 2020. Let's make it a good one. Let's make your drafts good ones. The best way to make your draft a good one, the GOAT draft, is by going to monkeyknifefight.com and getting our draft guide. If you if you want to watch no more videos, if you want to listen to zero more podcasts, if you want to do zero prep further than what you've done today, I promise you the best way to do so, as well as the best way to support the brand, us content creators, go to monkeyknifefight.com. Use the promo code BDGE when you deposit $10 or more and play a game on their site. As soon as you play a game on their site, I will email you access to the draft guide. Make sure you check your spam if it didn't come within 24 hours. I love y'all. I also love Football Outsiders. Their almanac is incredible. Footballoutsiders.com. The link will be in the description. Go check out some of the free stats, and I promise you the paid subscription is worth it. Thank you to you guys for, one, sending me the almanac and giving me access to these beautiful, beautiful, beautiful numbers, but more so letting me bring awareness to y'all, to my audience as a value prop that I believe will be very, 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 very helpful to any real football fans. It's a great read. It's got all the team breakdowns, all the player breakdowns, fantasy projections, all that stuff. If y'all enjoyed, make sure you hit the thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. We're doing fantasy five, six, seven, nineteen 19 days a week, and I'll be bike tomorrow. Peace.